Hello and welcome to episode 129 of Kaiju Curry House. I'm your regular host, Joe, and I am joined tonight by Alex, Paul, and special guest Jeremy Robinson, creator and author of Project Nemesis and 70 other books. He's a New York Times bestselling author, and we are lucky to have him tonight. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we're very excited to have you. But before we get started with anything interview related, what have Kaiju been up to? Alex, I'm picking on you first. What's been just, like that, just like that. Just like that. Like I was, um, you well, come out so early nowadays, you know. Uh, uh, absolutely. Okay. Well, as many of you will know, it is the spooky season, with it being October, and I have been diving back into the Yokai Monsters trilogy, of which, uh, funnily enough, with it being a trilogy, there are three films. I have rewatched Yokai Monsters along with Ghosts, and I have watched Spook Warfare. They were originally made by the Dai franchise, and then Katakawa bought them out. And Arrow Video released an absolutely stunning box set of them. And there's some really juicy goodies, some fantastic interviews that kind of explore the folklore around the Yokai trilogy. And yeah, in preparation for uh, Zach Davison, who's going to be coming on, who is one of the authors um, as part of the Arrow box set, I've been rewatching them and very much enjoying them. Um, Right back at you, Joe. What have Kaiju been up to? So Joe has been doing what he normally does, which is printing lots of 3D models that he has no time to paint. I recently completed an Audrey 2, which I took to my office. It took about two hours before anybody to realize that was not a real plant, which, you know, needless to say, the observational skills uh, where I work, you know, leave something a bit to be desired. But I've recently found a couple of new STL files, um, which have been exciting for me. I'll go ahead and uh, give the shout out to the artist's names at the end of the episode. But I have basically got the entire Universal Monsters lineup with amazing bases. And none of them costed me more than eight pounds on uh, the UK side, which I have to say is pretty economical for an STL. So I'm pretty excited about that. Additionally, I have been speed reading over the entire Nemesis saga in preparation with tonight's interview, so I am prepared to ask some cool and groovy questions. So, I get to pick again, I guess. Jeremy, what have <laughs> you been up to? Um, well, let's see. Uh, I've recently been watching the Pacific Rim, uh, the Black series, um, which... I had low expectations of, but I've really enjoyed. Um, it was surprisingly good. Um, and I just finished a novel a couple of days ago. Not a kaiju novel. There are big monsters in it, but I don't, I don't know that it would be classified as that kind of game. That's about mm -hmm. it. Well, you know, I think you've done enough of them at this point, and you've got enough going on with kaiju. I think we can wait, let you pass for that one. <laughs> It is now your job to bestow Paul the fabulous dad pun, which we've all enjoyed so far this episode. I have to remember it. What what what's a, what's a kaiju been what up to? Kaiju been up to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that one. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so yeah, spooky season. Trying to find some monster themed horror films because normally I go to the to the slashers, uh, but I did find something on. I think it's Freebie. It's called over here in the UK, which is like a it's on Amazon and it basically lets you watch films for free, but includes adverts. And there was a film on there called Freeze, uh, which seems to be done by a British film company. Uh, very low budget. And it's about uh, people on a rescue mission going to the Arctic to try and find another expedition crew that got lost out there. Um, and it sounds strangely familiar, like another film that I know of. I imagine it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it probably is familiar to many films. Uh, the, the creatures that are in it are like fish men type things. Okay, it's like a different turn. Fish men. All right. Yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, like fish men is how I describe them. Um, not just one, fish there men. be many of them there. Uh, and this is like humanoids from the deep meets the. Thing. I, I was just yes, going to say. Yes, very humanoids from the deep, but in yeah. the Arctic. Or the mermen in Cabin in the Woods. <laughs> Yeah, Jeremy got that right. That's, oh, that's a yeah. good shout, actually, Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, yeah. We need to be Cabin in the Woods this month. Let's do yeah. it. Right, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, Paul. Go on. Back but, um, to your humanoids I, I, from the deep. 
Uh, so yeah, I don't know if to go into spoilers over what what happened. No, you know, we know what happens in, this in, in the way. film. Um, needs to say, it wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's rated pretty lowly. Have you seen? <laughs> no, I've, I I just opened it up. <laughs> you just yeah. So yeah, Where it's got recommendations now, Paul. You better I can't recommend it. I can't recommend it. I thought oh, it might you know it might be a a cheap but enjoyable like creature horror, like uh, T Rex. Like Tammy and the T-Rex. Exactly like Tammy and the T-Rex. But unfortunately, no, the acting just didn't do the job. But the special effects are absolutely fine. And the story was pretty straightforward. But if they if the actors had carried it, it would have been fine. But I just felt it was a bit flat. So disappointed there. I can't recommend Freeze for the, the spooky season. I feel like you've been really true to yourself as a Brit today, uh, Paul, because, you know, the strongest criticism you have is I cannot recommend it. <laughs> like, it, it's quite clear what you are thinking inside, but the words aren't coming out. And the strongest criticism is that, is that you can't recommend, can't recommend it. it. I think, yeah. So polite. So polite, Joe. I think have to be. Yeah, Paul, Paul, sorry. Yeah. Um, other than that, I mean, um, Joe, you, you didn't mention a particular bus that you printed off. Is that going to be later on in the show? Ah, well, I have my Nemi, I have the Nemi bus behind me. Um, after we take a break, I will uh, get it. You'll and, get that, uh, okay. Because that's, that's obviously what we've both been up to. Um, it's primed as jet black. So for those of you who will tune in on YouTube, I, I don't know expect I don't know what you're expecting to see, but I'll put up some pictures. Don't worry. Uh, mine's, mine's white at the moment. So, um, you know, we can do a nice comparison there. There we go. You, anyway, enough about that. Should we dive in? I think we should dive in. So, Project Nemesis, one of the most original kaiju ideas coming out in the last 20 years. I say that it definitely holds its weight among the very best. Jeremy, um, before we get into the plot, I think we should probably limit ourselves to the first book. <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. Before we get into the plot, where was the inspiration for Nemesis? Um, for lots of different lots of different areas i grew up in boston which is where project nemesis takes place uh, just north of boston um and i would watch creature double feature every saturday morning which was basically the only way to watch godzilla back then um or gamma uh and so for me childhood was you know every saturday morning was godzilla and uh i would just spend a lot of time in my bedroom imagining looking out the window, picturing what it would look like if Godzilla was coming out of the ocean, which was not far from our house, and just like coming up the hill. I had lots of dreams about Godzilla. And so Kaiju has just kind of always been part of my life. Um, and Nemesis uh, is kind of born out of that appreciation for Godzilla at that time in my life, which was being just north of Boston. Um, so that's why Nemesis is set there. Uh, for Nemesis specifically, her look, um, in addition to like Godzilla was like Jeremy age one through 12 is when like creature double feature ran. Um, and then I kind of like graduated to aliens and James Cameron. And, uh, so Nemesis for me is like, if you took a Xenomorph and Godzilla and crammed them together, it's kind of like visually, uh, how I picture her, um, the goddess of vengeance aspect was that just came out of research because I wanted her to be more uh, and have like a history rather than just, uh, you know, come out of nothing. Um, yeah. When you say the goddess of vengeance and she has a history, um, this is a bit spoilerish for those of you who haven't read the books, but nemesis, the Kaiju that's, the anti-hero of this series, oh. um, she isn't the original nemesis. Correct. So when you say she has a history, she has kind of an ancestral or core memory from what came before. Right. But she yeah, has more, she has kind of a stake in humanity that her predecessor didn't and i right. find and i find that that's one of the more interesting aspects of the character so yeah. where did that element come in why why did you bring that in because i don't think many 
I think Gamera kind of touches on it, but definitely not yeah. to the degree that you do. Yeah, being a, a fan of the Gamera movies, I knew that I wanted Nemesis to have more of a character. Like Godzilla is cool, but it's kind of like a, just a force of nature. Uh, Gamera has much more involvement with the human characters, um, and I really wanted that, but in a in a different and original way. So combining them genetically, but then also keeping them as separate personalities who influence each other, um, I think really helped pull that off. And to make Nemesis a character, more than just a destructive force, but to make a kaiju that was sympathetic. Um, that people actually cared about um, personally. Yeah, yeah. So as we get into the book, first off, I got to say that in terms of how we're introduced to characters, mm. we have the direction that, you know, because I'd read reviews before I read it, um, we have kind of what we're expecting to see, which is, you know, the discovery of a skeleton in the wastelands and, you know, like all of this cloak and dagger uh, secret agent stuff. And then we jump to bears quite quickly there, don't we? Which was probably what hooked me. <laughs> so that, that was really enjoyable for me because, uh, and I have to say it with a smile on my face because one of the things that as an American, I get a lot in the United Kingdom is, you know, questions about guns and why is there such a survivalist mentality in the state? Uh -huh. why, where does this come from? And I bears. usually answer with bears. <laughs> yeah. So um, I really, I, can you talk about our, our, our main protagonist in the nemesis book here? Can you lead us through our, our, yeah. our, our fella? Uh, so John Hudson uh, is his name, and he is an agent with the uh, FCP, which is Fu Fusion Cell Paranormal, a division of uh, Homeland, is it Homeland Security? I think it is. Um, and there are actual fusion cells uh, all around the country, and they, they kind of coordinate all the different uh, security branches that we have here. Um, and so his job as the paranormal uh, agent um, or in charge of that division is to look into paranormal threats to America um, and of which there have been none. Um, yeah, so he's a pretty good gig, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, he ha he's, you know, he has to look into Sasquatch sightings and things like that. And um, sometimes turn out to it's, be it's kind of a joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so when Nemesis arrives on the scene, it's his job to coordinate the responses, but she's the first response or the first issue they've actually had to deal with. Um, so he is trying to figure out how to do his job while dealing with, like, worst case scenario is the first instance of anything strange uh, that the FCP actually has to deal with. It really is like a load of fun. Um, so what I can say is like probably a slightly darker version of it, although it came after would be Shin Godzilla, because you have a bunch of people where like, there are all these protocols and everything, but nothing applies. So everybody's right. kind of like, what? But anyways, yeah. So Jean, he, he has to kind of take this by the, by the, by the reins, but I will say, yeah, that the, the hook with the bear was brilliant. And for those of you who read it, it's quite funny. It's really good. And it's, it's unexpected, which is great in the Chandra. Um, the next, the next kind of like arc of the book, I guess you could say is uh, Nemesis's like kind of rampage through the missile base, I guess would be, mm -hmm. we, we have other plot lines, which are explored before, but to keep some surprises, we'll, we'll omit those. <laughs> so you move on to, a really interesting um, locale. Um, so we've got a missile base seemingly abandoned and Nemesis kind of awakens there and goes through a bit of an underground rampage mm -hmm. before coming above ground. And when you said earlier that, you know, like you were really influenced by alien, 
Mm-hmm. This is a great snapshot of that because what you've got essentially yeah. is a closed environment with a very dangerous thinking thing. And it's out to eat you. So yes. I think that you've got a couple of really great veins here, a couple of really great hooks and Nemesis fulfills them quite well. So with the envi- with with the closed environment, were you, I mean, like, I don't want to say you were looking to emulate Alien, but you, de- like, you definitely had Alien vibes going on there. And I was wondering how much of that you were wanting to take forward into the rest of the, into the rest of the story as right. opposed to going your typical kaiju route, because it looks like you kind of diverged paths here when you were writing. Mm-hmm. Nemesis grows, so it totally works with the story, but it yeah. looks like you made a choice here. So can take a right. And I, th- I think um, a lot of times when I'm writing novels, um, I'm not always thinking things through. It's kind of like I go where the story leads me. Um, so especially when it comes to like uh, an aliens vibe, xenomorph stuff like that, it's kind of like part of who I am. So I oftentimes will do that without even knowing I've done it. Um, but with this, I, d- I don't know that it was a conscious decision to make her uh, different as she grew. Um, it's just the way it worked out for that novel. And in the new novel, she is much more like a xenomorph throughout. Um, so she gets big, but physically uh, is more like a xenomorph and it's quick and agile and sneaky. Um, and in this one, she turned out to be bigger, still quicker than I think than the average kaiju. Um, I'd say she's much quicker than the average kaiju, just full. Yeah, story. she's she's live. So for those of you who are not joining on YouTube and perhaps can see some of our backgrounds, um, we've got snippets of Be- Nemesis in the background. Um, the creature, I guess, it would have been good to say kind of what Nemesis looks like, or at least we can broach this topic now. So Nemesis is not your typical kaiju. Uh, she stands on two legs, has two large honking arms, but that's kind of where the humanoid similarities end. Um, she's got a long tail, kind of a carapace along her back with a row of spikes. She's got large grappling hands, very long legs, and she has a head that looks like it could deliver quite a bite, but it's obviously not her main offensive weapon. And then along her sides, she has these glowing orbs and within these orbs, it's like a good combustible gunk. that's always glowing. So if you wound her there, it is at your own peril. And when it comes to her special abilities, because no Kaiju is without a good special ability. Am I right? She can vomit up some of this orange goo, which is coated in her saliva. And as it is combustible, once it like while it's leaving her mouth obviously it's coated in her own saliva but when it hits you that's when the fun happens so she is lithe um i wouldn't say not muscular but lithe is definitely the word i would use he is intelligent so long as she is not hungry or out to get you and when i say that <laughs> i mean like she's not mad at you because she can get mad she is an emotional creature that sounds bad when you say she is an emotional creature, but the creature has vaguely human emotions. So we will, we will spin it that way. And she has an alternative form as well that she takes when she really means business. I think that would be accurate to say. Yeah. So all these characteristics um, were put together and, Forgive me and and correct me if I'm wrong. Matt Frank came up with a character design for Nemesis, Mm -hmm. you know, to kind of take all these traits. And a lot of media since then has kind of adopted that design. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I I take it Matt nailed it on the head for what you were looking at, looking for, correct? Yep. There were a few things I think that we ended up changing the novel to like adapted towards what he had come up with. But it was, you know, everything that is core to Nemesis was there uh, in his original design. So, yeah, there wasn't, we didn't have to go through a lot of scrapping different designs 
yeah, I think he nailed it on the first one. And yeah, it's it's kind of stuck since then. I don't know um, if the TV series will stick with that or if they'll change it. Um, and like I said, in the new novel, it should be very similar, but even quicker um, and built for speed. Very cool. So Nemesis, like, she evolves over the course of the first book. Mm-hmm. And again, a slight spoiler here, but we're going to omit some details to keep it fun. Um, her base genome starts as a human donor genome. So in true scientist fashion, and this is a reoccurring theme on this podcast, scientists cannot be trusted. <laughs> you cannot leave them on their own. They either end up getting eaten, infected, letting something loose, or creating something. And I feel you've touched on every single one of those chords. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so Nemesis has a base genome. So they find something in the waste. It is the remains of what we will call Nemesis Prime. Mm-hmm. And they want to see what its genome and whatever is comprised of comprised of and what the benefits could be. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why you get into genetic research, but they needed a base. So in true fashion, they just took a donor genome or a donor sample from the archives thinking, oh, we shouldn't scan this or see where it comes from or whatnot. And Nemesis starts out looking quite human in the test tube. Yep. But I think the more she eats people, the more different she becomes. She kind of deviates right. from humanity when she starts eating people. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting thread in and of itself that plays out very well in the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. And I dare say that's one of the main plot points of the series, the human or sentient being, shall we call it, yep. um, pairing and and sympathizing with a kaiju. Right. You take it in a different direction than Gamera did in the 90s. You do your own thing. I want to make perfectly clear for listeners that this is an original idea, and it's quite cool. And basically, it's uh, it, later on in the series, it's what every kid dreams of, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah, so Nemesis is evolving. So when we go back to her appearance... Um, in some of like, again, for those of you looking in YouTube, you're like, well, that thing kind of has a human face. There's a reason for that. And, um, there's a very human mind behind Nemesis at some points in the series as well. So that's quite cool. So tell me about why we decided to go with goddess of vengeance after we did the rampaging monster, like it materializes within the story and there's a, there's a specific reason for it. I think one of the big surprises of the book, how closely nemesis is tied to her donor. But when you wanted like the history, the goddess, of, the goddess of vengeance, and then we even have a divine retribution form, I think is, a, is <laughs> the terminology that you use. You really took it to the nth degree there. Yep. And yeah, I'm just curious as a reader and a fan, why did you go that direction? You know, <laughs> I never she, have. She could, like, have just good him. she could have just stepped on him, but no, Jeremy had to make it painful. So I do. I, I always take things to the extreme. Um, and with things like Nemesis, I don't, I don't plan it out ahead of time. It's kind of like when I get to the point where she could just step on him. I'm like, well, that's just kind of boring. So like, what could we do different? And then rather than doing something different, what can we do that's like ridiculously extreme? Um, so that's where I tend to take most things. Um, and I I knew that I wanted her, well, that's probably a spoiler. I knew what I wanted her final form to be like, I didn't know what it would do, honestly, until I started writing it, um, which is how most of my novels go. Um, so a lot of the details about Nemesis, well, I, uh, like her skin being fungus-like, 
Um, is this something that comes to me as I'm writing it? Um, sometimes I forget. Um, I think it was, it was a couple of years after uh, Nemesis had been complete. I went on a Nemesis wiki and it said something about her skin being fungus-like. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> is that accurate? So I had to go back and look uh, because I write these things uh, so fluidly um, that it doesn't always stick in my head. But with the final form, it, it was the same kind of thing where uh, it just kind of came out. I don't, I don't know how that works, but that's just how it does for me. That's what fine. Saying, Sorry, uh, Joe. One mm -hmm. of the ways that I would describe the whole Nemesis series, to be fair, is Stranger Things meets Godzilla. Yeah. And the way that it, it's not like there's, there's not necessarily an upside down. But, um, I mean, you definitely go into alternate dimensions, but um, later on at least. But um, you don't know where the story is going to go. And I think that, that it's a very easy hole to fall into trying to replicate Tolkien or like other great authors who clearly had their works mapped out. Yeah. And you could like if if you've read enough books of the same genre i feel like some things become cliche and you learn to spot some plot threads and you're like oh well i know what's going to happen there the project nemesis series does not do that and that was one of the things that i found most enjoyable about it all of us who are currently here sitting on this podcast right now we've got decades worth of kaiju lore sitting and rattling around in our heads we can spot when somebody's just regurgitating right. kaiju films or kaiju books or whatever that they've seen before. The great thing about Nemesis is like you say, you just went with where the pen was taking you. You yeah. were just along for the ride. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm sure somewhere there's someone who's a university lecturer or teacher saying, never write like that that is terrible you must have an outline of your story yada yada yeah. yada but it's so refreshing just to have a completely random chain of events because in reality that's what something like this would play out as right so godzilla in 2014 for all intents and purposes gareth edwards delivered us a great film he had to like make certain nods to godzilla's lore we all understand that but that, but that is about as linear a story as you can get. Yes. We've got a great Jaws reveal of Godzilla. We've got lackluster character development because none of us were there for that. We've got a great <laughs> kaiju fight at the end. We've got, you know, the hero moment, kiss of death when Godzilla does his thing. You know, like we've got all of these elements, but it's the same story that we've seen play out yes. so many different times. And again, what you did is we have a murder mystery. We have rangers, spies, you know, like that kind of thread in the wilderness flying a fossilized kaiju. We have the most intense bear exercise ever. I mean, like, these are just like the start of this book and like all the threads interconnect. And it's just such a great ripper and yarn. But again, to take back to the point I was making, Stranger Things, I think what we all enjoyed about that is we had no idea where it mm. was going. Yeah. And like we could all tell it was kind of like a D&D esque story. It was set in the 80s, great. But then, you know, like all these different layers that were eventually added on, none of us were expecting that. And again, it's part of what makes such a great story you don't know where it's going to go that's yeah. why you keep reading that's why you keep listening so when you say that like kudos for being that brave <laughs> and taking that direction because i i cannot write like that unfortunately i have to have an outline yeah but, it is it is tricky to uh to do that it's kind of like i dig myself a hole you know and then 300 pages in have to figure out how i'm going to get myself out of it so it is. It can be tricky at times to figure out the solution to the problems that you've created. Um, but I think for me, it's like um, it's like ADHD writing, where every chapter has to has to go in a new direction to keep me interested as I'm writing. 
Um, so I think it works to keep people interested as they're reading uh, because I'm always surprised, uh, what, which means the reader is always going to be surprised. Um, so there you have it, folks. Other folks with ADHD, you're going to love these two books. I get lots of messages from people saying I could read Project Nemesis was the first book I've been able to read in years um, for that very reason, because they don't know where it's going and because it's always kind of amping up. All right, I'm going to give you one more question, then I'm going to let Paul and Alex talk. So do you ever get folks who don't like it on the flip side? Do you ever get people who call you out for it? Um, not, not in a kaiju fan way. There's been some people who would not take credence with a poor plot. Let me tell you, I'll, 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 I'll answer <laughs> yeah. further there. Kaiju fans hardly care about the plot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, th there have been some people where uh, that didn't like, John Hudson's sarcastic sense of humor or, or choice of colorful language, you know, things like that, that I might get for any of my books. This is um, why I, I can't understand why this hasn't taken off so well in the, United, in the United Kingdom, because sarcasm is just like, it's the national language. Correct me if yeah. I'm wrong, fellas. <laughs> A polite chuckle from Paul. Right. Yeah, so you also you're getting from me. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Um. You mentioned about how, like, to use your metaphor, you dig yourself a hole when you're writing, almost as a way of keeping yourself excited as a writer, because, yep. you know, how, how many novels have you written now? I would guess 75. Okay, so, like, it's an impressive catalogue, yep. but I imagine kind of the danger with that is that you almost risk becoming bored as an author, because that, that's such a huge amount of writing, right? Yep. And it almost becomes another day in the office. So how would you kind of manage that system where you want to be erratic and kind of expressive enough that things have that free form, but also enough kind of control that there is a structure? Because I, I'm not a writer at all. So like, how, how would you manage that? Right. I think because I've been doing it for so long that the structure is kind of intuitive now. It's like an instinct. Um, where I get to a certain point where I'm writing and I'm like, all right, I need to start wrapping this up and start, you know, bring everything together. Um, and it, it might be that I just noticed the word count. Like if I see that I'm at like 70,000, 80,000 words, then I know that, you know, I have to start bringing things together. Um, so I think that's probably what it is, is I, I just start seeing that number climb towards where I know I need to bring it back to an ending that's around 90 or 100,000 words. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I don't plan it. It's just kind of like a natural thing that happens now. I think the first few novels that I did with a the publisher, they made me outline and I hated that. Um, and I'm pretty sure every time I had to do that, I ended up going my own way anyways. Um, yeah. so, and I, I, I don't know, I had struggled with an outline. I don't know how people do that and then feel creative sticking to it. Where um for listeners and viewers who don't know kind of your impressive catalog, where does Project Nemesis as a concept sit kind of in your career? Um, probably in the middle. Okay. Um, yeah, I lose track of how long I've been writing. Um, yeah, I, I mean. Yeah, probably in, in the middle, because this is when I started writing in first person. I Did I write John Hudson in first person? I think I did. Um, yes, yes, you did. Yeah, and then there are other parts of the book that are in uh, third person. Mm -hmm. uh, so John Hudson was one of the first novels that I started writing in first person. And since that time, like halfway through my career, I've been writing in first person ever since. It's just much more natural for me. Um, I do write faster that way. Uh, I feel like it adds a little more suspense because your knowledge as a reader is limited to what the character knows um, mm -hmm. rather than having some omniscient narrator being able to tell you everything about everything. Um, yeah, so that just, that, it's just more natural for me. Um, and I think Hudson was one of the first I did that with. Thank you so much. I think my final question before I pass over to Paul um, for our listeners who, you know, I'm sure many people love the idea of writing a novel, but 
so few mm-hmm. of us actually do get around to it. How did you find your love of writing? How did that actually happen? Um, well, for the first 20 years of my life, I was an artist um, and I wanted to be a comic book artist. And um, it was kind of, I got married young at 20 and then we were like living this bohemian lifestyle, traveling and things like that. And it was along the way during all that, that it kind of occurred to me that all of my artwork was about telling stories. So as we were traveling, I started writing screenplays um, uh, just because I love movies so much. Um, And it was, that was a kind of an obvious first step to go from, you know, comic books to, to movies. And I did that for about 13 years. We moved out to Los Angeles and I worked at an agency and kind of did all that thing and then decided to come back here because Los Angeles isn't a lovely place to live. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, writing novels was just kind of like a, an evolution from that. And I believe it was around 2000 or so when like the Harry Potter movies were coming out or the Rings movies were coming out and all these books were getting adapted. And I was like, you know, the fastest way to get a movie made might be to write novels <laughs> because so many novels were getting made into movies. And so I just gave it a crack and it's just you know flowed ever since well thank you so much um paul over to you please yeah um i think actually it might be an ideal time to take a quick break um and then we'll come back and i'll ask some questions uh welcome back to the kaiju curry house uh we are talking with me jeremy robinson uh about project nemesis and uh all things nemesis related brilliant Absolutely. thank you very much right so jeremy my turn to ask some questions uh you've mentioned about how it's based not based it's influenced by alien aliens Mm -hmm. and at the beginning of the story when nemesis isn't so big Mm -hmm. um there's some scenes in a a base were you tempted at all to to keep her smaller um for a bit longer you didn't want to kind of do more of an aliens at all you were quite happy to about the alien things thing. on your head like you did and it's it's growing and so when it comes back to the same corridors that it thinks it can play cat and mouse with, it, yeah. it can't quite fit in that well anymore which was brilliant yeah, um, <laughs> i don't i think that i because aliens is so much part of my imagination that i had done other things that are similar that i didn't have that kind of like desire to to stick with it um like it wasn't the, my only chance to do something inspired by Xenomorphs. Uh, I think the novel Raising the Past, um, which was my second novel, uh, is also very Aliens inspired, but then comes into the Nemesis saga uh, in book four. Um, so it's kind of like, the you know, it all kind of connects and I'm always like getting Xenomorphs out of my system. Um, so I didn't have that kind of like irresistible desire to keep her small. And it was the first, first intentional, like Kaiju story. So I think I was probably actually eager to make her large. Yeah. Okay. That's brilliant. Um, and then if we talk about, about, uh, general Gordon, general Lance Gordon, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That, didn't see that coming. Um, <laughs> I thought it was just going to be like the monster and, and that whole story. But you've got a whole separate storyline about yeah. this general and, and his objective. But did that, was that always there? Did you always want to do that? Or did you think, oh, I'll have a creature and then actually I want to add something on? Yeah, total, total random, yeah. Um, unintentional. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I think it's, it just comes out of that this is what I wrote today. Tomorrow needs to be different. How can I do that? All right. So I'll do a chapter about Gordon uh, that has nothing to do with, you know, the previous day's chapter. Um, and that just uh, keeps it all interesting for me. Okay. And I know we've touched a bit about the uh, Nemesis Prime. I think you refer mm-hmm. to them to as Joe. Um, we don't really hear anything about them in in project nemesis there's so little said again was that intentional so that you would so you could follow up with future novels or had you not quite thought of it and thought well, do you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna leave it leave it as is for now 
And that, yeah, that's very much of, oh, how can I make this interesting? Mm. <laughs> and then I kind of just uh, word spew this history onto the page. And I'm like, all right, that sounds cool. Uh, and then definitely something that I have to revisit and flesh out later. I do that all the time. Um, it, it, the worst is when I forget that I've done it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, that that's the kind of thing that we fix in, in edits. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not not planned and uh, definitely just came out of the ether. Okay, so so when I take when you were coming up with Project Nemesis, it was going to be a, a standalone book, was it? As far as you were concerned at the time, or did you always have an inkling? Yeah, I didn't know. You know, there was no uh, previous kaiju non Godzilla project that had been published as a novel, so I really had no concept of how something like that would do. Um, so I was pretty happy when it did really well because uh, it meant I got to do more. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that probably is a hard sell uh, for publishers. I mean, there's only been, to my knowledge, one kaiju novel published by a major publisher aside from the Nemesis books. Um, they I have to remember it. it has kaiju in the title. It's by it by John Scalzi. I can't remember the kaiju society, something like that. Um, Kaiju Preservation, Preservation Society. Oh, yes, yeah. Kaiju Preservation Society. Um, yeah, and I think there still hasn't been that many Kaiju projects uh, done in the mainstream. I mean, technically, Nemesis isn't even in the mainstream, so. But um, I'll take credit for <laughs> the, <laughs> well done. You know, creating the genre. There you go. Yeah. Pioneering author, Jeremy Robinson, created the yeah. Kaiju literary genre. Yeah. There we are. Oh. I think it's interesting to see that word coming into the uh, the Western vernacular as well, which you mentioned it earlier. Pacific Rim definitely played a role in mm -hmm. because you know even when people were mad about Godzilla sure. movies, kaiju wasn't a word people were using. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's. All right. So we've got Project Nemesis, but there are other books. So. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, where does Project Nemesis sit in the Nemesis saga? Because it's not the first book that you should read chronologically, is it? Or not necessarily. Right. Yeah, you could switch them out. So the, technically, the first book is Island 731, um, which takes place very far away from Project Nemesis um, and kind of cut off from the rest of the world for a bit. Um, so if they do happen, you know, at the same exact time, it's totally possible um, that the people in Island 731 wouldn't know what was going on in Boston. Um, so, so yeah, you, you could read them in either direction, but you definitely need to read Island 731 before book two of Nemesis, which is, oh wait, yeah, book two, which is Project Mygo, where the characters from Island 731 show up and then continue on into the third book, which is Project 731. So Island 731, we have to talk about this book because it is like a Dr. Moreau sort yeah. of island book. So when when we're so if you're fans of like the kaiju genre, yes, it has monsters. Yes, it has quite terrifying apparitions on this island where all sorts of horrendously and fiendishly illegal experiments have been going on inhumane to the max and it's a different tone of story and mm. it's a different type of story in the sci-fi genre um so if you're looking for a kaiju story there you're not going to get the same thing as nemesis so i feel like people wanting to read uh project nemesis and the ensuing novels in that series, you will get a lot of lore out of Island 731. But if you go in looking at it, or you go in with it, it's kind of, I, I don't know how else to say this, but you know, in terms of getting a broad, a broad, broad appeal with a few comments, it's kind of like watching Captain Marvel in the Avengers universe before you've seen any of the other films be like oh nick fury is that supposed to matter or oh captain marvel 
huh, you know, it's these things don't necessarily make sense, even though chronologically it's the first. So Island 731 has one of your more terrifying creations in it. Um, there are young people who listen to this podcast, so we will not explain what BFS means, but they are large spiders and you call them Suchi? Is that, is that, or how do you pronounce it? Sushi. Pronounce- is it? No, it's not. It, I used to know how to say it. Suchi. Suchi? Suchi, yeah. All right. So what you've got is this horrible abomination. You've got like crab legs coming out of a turtle shell carapace with like a spider's head. They've got pincers, right? They have pincers? Yeah. Yeah. You've given them pincers because, you know, you couldn't just leave it at that. And then they've got a scorpion tail. And what the scorpion tail does is it injects you with baby Suchi. And they do, again, you love Geiger. So what do they do? They burst (laughs) out of you. And we're not talking about a slow gestation here either, are we? Seconds, How long did you give it? Five minutes, maybe less? I think it was quicker than that. I think it was in seconds. Yeah. So this is like the worst creature ever. And um, they quickly, you know, get out of hand on this island. There are other things going on on this island. I don't want to ruin um, the novel for everybody. There are other truly terrible things happening here. Yeah, some disturbing stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how How is your social life going? When you wrote that, were you okay, Jerry? <laughs> I don't have much of a social life. I, my social life is online gaming there we go. Oh. and family. All right. Well, Paul's gonna ha- gonna have to ask you a question now. I'll let you go ahead, Paul. Well, well. The, the gamer in the group. You're not gonna ask the question. Well, I'll, I'll be asking what 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 you, what are you what do you play, play then, Jeremy? Yeah. Um, I'm currently playing Modern Warfare Two. I'm looking forward to the zombies mode coming up. For yes, um, open world zombies. Yeah, uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, just because I, we, you know, we've been playing this. Me and my friends have been playing this for a while because uh, those kind of games give us a little bit of time to like chat and catch up and make jokes, and yeah. then you get in a fight and then you know move on. And uh, so it's more of a social gaming experience than uh, absolute domination, kill as many people as possible kind of a thing. Even though that's kind of how I play. Uh, yeah, so it's it's good fun and uh, with friends rather than just uh, going oh yeah, to the nothing worse than some randos. It's, uh... <laughs> I mean, that can be funny, uh, but yeah. Well, I, I'll just just go completely off talk. I've been playing Payday Three, and mm-hmm. that's all about communication as a squad. You don't want random people running off doing their own thing. Yes, yes, which can happen when you play with your friends too, though. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy Jenkins, I'll make the reference. Uh-huh. Anyways, um, so get back. Suchi on Island 731, these terrible spider monsters, um, they are kind of the one of the main threads that takes place in the later uh, novels. And to be fair, I, I feel like I'm not spoiling much because a giant Suchi is on the cover. So I feel yep. like I feel like we're not necessarily spoiling an element here. Um Needless to say, these spider things, oh, terrible. And they uh, they meet up with Nemesis. One of them stings Nemesis. And thus, a giant, ugly, terrible spider monster is born. Because yep, yep. they take on aspects of their host. Right. So, again, we've, we've got a great Geiger theme going there. But somehow you may have managed to make Alien worse. Because you, <laughs> because you turned it into a spider. Um, anywho, uh, we've got lots of kaiju action that seems to accelerate towards the end of the Nemesis storyline. Yep. And you end it with Project Legion, as I as I recall. So Project Legion is, I I guess, it's like your Avengers assemble. Like it, it is, it is everything coming. You touch on multiple storylines and different books that you've read in the past, or not read, yep. written in the past, which is really fun. Um, Kronos, the book that you mentioned earlier, um, when we were off off break, um, it was one of your first creature feature um, sort of forays, and that's 
briefly mentioned in Project Legion. I totally yep. got that in there. Yep. And um, it's great because you've got kind of, it's like your Destroy All Monsters book. Mm -hmm. But it's deeper than that because you've got a great bunch of human character elements as well. You've introduced a giant mecha. And the mecha has like an AI. I'm not going to say it's necessarily Jarvis, but yeah. it's pretty neat that it has the nanotechnology to adapt to its driver. And then it also has its own history in the Nemesis saga as well. And I will spoil this because the original Nemesis Prime was killed by the mech that someone yeah. pilots later on in the series. And this mech, I shall say it for your benefit, Alex, has Jet Jaguar vibes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm okay with. I think everybody's always okay with a bit of Jet Jaguar. Absolutely. Yeah, I love Jet Jaguar. It's, it's one of those like instant passes, you know, like, okay, there we go. It's got but, the Jet Jaguar in. Yeah. yeah. And it's a fantastic series for anybody who is a fan of the kaiju genre. Um, they're very readable. Um, I would say that there's probably an age starting point that we should, <laughs> we should work from. I think that you have to have teen somewhere in your age in order to read them. I wouldn't go any lower than that simply because of language and, well, in Island 731's case, gratuitous violence and war crimes. But um, <laughs> Yeah. In addition to like the world's worst monster, again, spiders, Tolkien would have hated you. But um, <laughs> yeah, so those are all fantastic books. That's why we wanted you on the podcast. But then the other thing that's really exciting is that Sony was interested in your books yep. and something is in the works. Can you tell us about that? Um, well, we've got a TV series in development. Um, you say it a bit louder. Hmm? You say it a bit louder. <laughs> Be proud of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so that is with uh, Chad Stahelski, the director of all the John Wick movies. Um, and it is being produced by Original Film and financed by Sony. Uh, so it's kind of like this, you know, best case scenario in terms of the people making it. Um, and so we, uh, things got slowed down by the writer's strike, but I think we're back on track and hopefully we'll have good news to share in the next few months. I don't, you know, timing with all this stuff is all over the place. Um, so who knows really when I'll get to say anything more, but very positive uh, direction things are going in currently. Um, I wish I could say when it would be <laughs> released. I'm hoping sometime in the next two years. I think I feel like that's a realistic uh, perspective, given that it's been like 10 years since Chad and I first spoke. Um, so it's been a very long process to get the show made. But I mean, I feel like that's to be expected when you're trying to do something like Project Nemesis, uh, which is so strange and big and uh, costly. Um, you know, so... Not super surprising that it took so long, but I'm ready for it to, to get made. Uh, and I think we're almost there. And it's all of the Nemesis books, correct? Correct. It is Island 731 and then the rest of the Nemesis saga. I do not know yet if they will pull in other books that are connected, like Raising the Past, um, mm. like the the Ferox that are in... Uh, towards the end of the books. Yeah. They originate in uh, Race from the Past. So it's possible that they could pull in some more books, um, but I currently there isn't any plans. I think we have to get to like season five before, you know, we start talking about that stuff. Yeah, and you can always do spin-off stuff too. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be in continuity. So what so like in theory you know in a, in a good world we'd like to see project nemesis coming out in like two years time you know won't hold you to it but um do you have any idea like what a season is going to look like is it going to be like a season per book or you know like one or like you know like project legions over like two seasons do you yeah know? i don't i don't know exactly what the plan is um i i know that chad mentioned it was a couple of years ago that we talked about 
uh, Island 731 and Nemesis kind of sharing season one um, as they progress together and then coming together. Um, but I mean, that could be done in one season. It could be done in two. Um, so uh, it depends on how much they want to stretch it out and stick to each book. I mean, I think it would be personally difficult to do, um, you know, if it if it's like on a streaming service and what's the standard eight or 10 episodes, yeah. um, you know, it'd be hard to cover Island 731 and Project Nemesis in a single season. Um, Both have a significant amount of, moment of momentum too. So yeah. if it were to shift between stories, it could be potentially jarring. Whereas I could see 731 being told as flashbacks in Project 731 or something like that. Yeah. Getting people used to this, you know, used to and hooked on the story before we throw god awful spiders at them. You know, <laughs> that could probably be a thing. So you say that this has been in the works for 10 years. And with regards to all of the creature designs, and again, we're not holding this to you, but it'd be interesting to get your take and just see what, what you can answer with. Are they remaining pure, like really faithful to the character designs that you and Matt Frank came up with? Are they going based off of those? Or are they taking the approach that say, Legendary's Godzilla to where there is, where the core is, you know, quite similar, but we've taken it in a new organic direction. Right. I think, I think they'll probably make changes. I don't know what they would be. Um, I think um, Tad and I once spoke that if he made changes, it would be anything that is reminiscent of Godzilla. They would want to change in some way so that there was no confusing them at all. Um, they want people to see it as something totally original. Yeah, uh, so, I feel like that's yeah, sensible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I'm not concerned about it. I think they'll keep the key features like the mm -hmm. orange membranes and things like that. Um, so I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they come up with. Um, for me, that's super exciting. Like, I'm not going to be upset. Um, whatever it is, I'm psyched. I'm there for, you know, whatever they do. There are going to be so many one liners in this series as well. I mean, <laughs> You, you certainly spout off quite a few, but what, I mean, like one of them that just stays with me um, is, and I won't say it because again, potentially young listeners, but Ellen Ripley in Aliens has a very famous line at the end when yeah. she dons the uh, robot suit. And you have a similar point later on in the series where someone does something similar, but it's quickly deflated because the rest of the characters you know, around that are witnessing this and are a part of the scene are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so like this part, this character is just suddenly so deflated, like, Pee! you know, I really enjoyed that because yeah. that's just the kind of thing that would occur in a real world scenario where nerds were like <laughs> loose, you know? Like, yep. <laughs> so yes. yeah, I, it, it, it has the potential to be like really great. And like I said earlier, it's Stranger Things meets Godzilla, kind of the vibe that you have here. With probably a dash of alien thrown in, mm. or at least certainly a lot more Demogorgon. But it would be really great. So this is this is something that Sony's doing. We're making it as a series. Sony has its own streaming platform, I take it. I haven't seen one. I don't think so. No? Okay. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, so I'm curious where it will come out with, but hopefully we'll get lots of cool details. Pri Prime? Prime would be the obvious one, wouldn't it? Prime, it could, Prime could be Netflix. Could be they'll, Netflix. they'll rename it Nemesis Prime, not Project Nemesis. <laughs> 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 but there we go. Oh, but it's absolutely fantastic that this series is happening because one of the things that we talk about so often on this podcast, I feel, is the lack of original ideas taking yeah. root in the genre. And Godzilla which I do not want to pick on. Um, so I won't use it in this case. So I'll shift to Gamera instead. Mm. We finally got a new Gamera series on Netflix. Yes. I will hold my hand up and say that I haven't watched. I haven't watched it yet either. But all of the monsters are the original monsters from the Shawa period. 
Mm -hmm. So the originality for me, like I feel like we had we had an opportunity here and yeah, we just yeah. went with fan fan service and nostalgia, which has its place. But for those of us who really enjoy Gamera, like we have the shower movies, we have the Hasty movies. I think we have one millennium film and you know Gamera the Brave. But where's the new and original? I mean, we yeah. had we had new and original before, and those were some of the most beloved films of the '90s because yep. we had Legion, we had Iris, two incredibly awesome villains. Yep. And then we had an opportunity here, and it's animated. Why not? And mm. Godzilla. I mean, I said I wasn't going to pick on it, but it is the ultimate culprit of this. Yes. Because it keeps going back to the same tried and true formula. Right. It's There's a lot only of so many times that you can reintroduce Ghidorah, Mothra, and Rodan. And now yeah. Mechagodzilla in, into the film franchise, and it gets right. old. I think the one thing that's currently saving Legendary is people wanted to see Godzilla and Kong, and they're getting that. Yeah. So Nemesis, a wholly original IP, and new monsters. And you have yeah. some monsters, you know, which like make a nod, like you have a monster called the Giger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we know where that's going. But I mean, all of your other monsters are pretty original. I mean, you've kind of got right. a Lovecraftian, you know, you call it Lovecraft, a Cthulhu type character, which right. fair enough, but you know, like we're making a nod there. Yeah. And Cthulhu even necessarily appears that much. And, you know, we've got all of these great things coming for fans of the Kaiju genre. And it, it's going to be truly great to see and I, I, I can totally see all the fans embracing this, but you've got something original here and it's high time that finally got the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope it gets it. Well, there we go. So we've reached the end of this episode. What's absolutely fantastic is you have a new book coming out. Yes. That is Nemesis. Yep. So you've got... An alternate reality take, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's not it's not a reboot. It doesn't erase what came before. Um, I write all of my books kind of in what we call the Robinson verse, where they are parallel worlds. So this is a parallel world to the original Nemesis uh, that takes place 13 years, which is now, after the original Nemesis uh, story. So it, it looks at what the world would be like if uh, a few details of that original origin story were changed. Um, I don't want to say what that is, um, but there's you know one core change that happens that takes the whole story in a much darker direction. So for listeners who are interested by this a new idea, this alternate take of Nemesis, we're having Jeremy back on in November where we will be discussing the new book, which is awesome. Uh, we have all been given the opportunity to read it ahead of time. So far, it is a load of fun, and it has a lot of great stuff going for it. So we will be discussing it, not necessarily spoiler heavy, but we're going to have a ball in November going over it. And Jeremy, you have been so kind to volunteer signed copies of the book. Yep. So we're going to have two signed copies of the book, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And for listeners who want to take part, all we're asking is questions for Jeremy. And if you would like to have the opportunity to win one of those, please tag us on social media with your questions, which we will then give to Jeremy in November for him to answer. And we can all read along and have a hoot talking about the new Nemesis novel. So that is what is new and exciting coming forward on Kaiju Curry House. However, we cannot end the episode without If Nothing Else. So, Jeremy, If Nothing Else, what would you recommend to our viewers? Huh, can I recommend my own books? I mean, if, if you're a fan yeah, of- you, I, I mean, to be fair. <laughs> if you're a fan of kaiju uh, and you would like to read kaiju novels, I have uh, many more than Nemesis. Obviously, if you haven't read Nemesis, that would be great. Uh, but there's also Tether, 
The Divide, uh, Apocalypse Machine is one of my favorites of my books. Um, Kronos, like you said, uh, you know, I'm, I would probably say 50 to 60% of my books would qualify as kaiju books, even if I haven't labeled them as such. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them have monsters, if not a giant monster. Um, like, uh, for example, my novel Pulse features the Hydra. Um, I would consider that a kaiju, but not everyone does. Um, so, yeah. I, did I mention Tether? Tether is cool because it's ghost kaiju. Um, which Ooh. is, you know, for this time of Let's year. It's the yokai territory there, Alex. Cool. It's exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of kaiju novels uh, in addition to Nemesis. And hopefully if Nemesis does well, then, you know, other people will want to make some other stuff. There we go. Paul, if nothing else. If nothing else, um, yeah, just to reiterate, read Project Nemesis if you can, because I've given it a read. And although I'm not a massive reader, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I look forward to reading the rest of the series. I've just got to make sure I read it in the right order now. <laughs> um, expand on this universe. Um, I'd love to hear if any of our listeners have read the comics, uh, because... Mm -hmm. As Joe said, they're very hard to get hold of, and it'd be great to hear so what what people's opinions are of those. And lastly, um, I did mention I watched a film a while back called um, Snake King Island, and it was a Chinese film. And I found it on YouTube, which was obviously just someone must, someone must have uploaded it. Um, but I found out how to watch it the proper way. Um, so if anyone wants to watch some Chinese monster films, go to iq.com and it's effectively like a Netflix service where you can watch all these Chinese and Asian shows. There's, you know, dramas, there's romances, but there's a slew of stuff with snakes and serpents and monsters and stuff. So absolutely check out iq.com if you fancy something that you wouldn't see on your normal streaming service. There you go. And Alex. Yeah. Um, Joe, you mentioned earlier about how we have like, you know, a wide range of knowledge as uh, Kaiju fans, all four of us here. And what I would like our listeners to do is to check out one of my favorite books, which is like an encyclopedia on Kaiju culture. It's called Killer Kaiju Monsters, Strange Beasts of Japanese Film. And that was written by Ivan Vartanian. And it's basically like a guidebook to the tropes of kaiju film. And on reading that, I'd then like you to kind of take it and apply it to Jeremy's characters and see what tropes can you spot, uh, what abilities do these kaiju have that you can see, and like start drawing your own comparisons to other kaiju media. That's it. Here we go. I mentioned earlier in the podcast that uh, I had printed um, A Creature from the Black Lagoon. It is from, you can get the files from My Mini Factory. It's from Heroes and Beasts. And there is a cl classic monsters line that the artist has done. It is, they are titled just as they would appear. They are Creature from the Black Lagoon, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Mummy. You know, like they just go through the line. So there's that. I have the comics. I am lucky enough to have gotten them before I left the United States, and they'll be mm -hmm. pried from my cold, dead hands. They are fantastic. If you can find them on eBay, a local gaming or comic book store, what have you, snap them up. There mm -hmm. are covers by Bob Eggleton who, who we, and Matt Frank, both of which we've had on the podcast. They're fantastic artists and swell guys, and they love kaiju just as much as anybody. But the fact that they came together on this project is really great. There's a lot of really fun nods in all of their art as well. Um, the Gothic Press, who did the comic, comics, is now um, no longer in action. But uh, they do float around and make random appearances uh, when you go looking for them. So my advice would be to hunt them down before the series comes out. Because <laughs> yes. it will be truly hard to get your hands on. But there we go. So once again, for everybody, please uh, tag us on social media with questions for Jeremy ahead of our November 20th, I think it is, episode. And we will read your questions. And hey, you might have a chance at a signed copy 
of Jeremy's new Nemesis book, which is absolutely like beyond awesome. So there we <laughs> go. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you absolutely a ton for being on the podcast with us, Jeremy. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in November. And as always, folks, keep it kaiju.